Something, somewhere, somewhen, must have happened differently. Petunia Evans married Michael Varis, a professor of biochemistry at Oxford. Harry James Potter Evans Varis grew up in a house filled to the brim with books. He once bit a math teacher who didn't know what a logarithm was. He's read Gödel, Escher, Bach, and Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases, and Volume 1 of the Feynman Lectures on Physics. And despite what everyone who's met him seems to fear, he doesn't want to become the next Dark Lord. He was raised better than that. He wants to discover the laws of magic and become a god. Hermione Granger is doing better than him in every class, except broomstick riding. Draco Malfoy is exactly what you would expect an 11-year-old boy to be like if Darth Vader were his doting father. Professor Quirrell is living his lifelong dream of teaching defense against the dark arts, or as he prefers to call his class, battle magic. His students are all wondering what's going to go wrong with the defense professor this time. Dumbledore is either insane or playing some vastly deeper game which involves setting fire to a chicken. Deputy Headmistress Minerva McGonagall needs to go off somewhere private and scream for a while. Presenting Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. You ain't guessing where this one's going. And then Janet was a squib. That was only 28, but it was time to go back and meet Harry. Draco's feet were heavy as he walked through the corridors of Hogwarts. He should have been running, but he couldn't seem to muster the energy. He kept on thinking that he didn't want to know about this. He didn't want to be involved in any of this. He didn't want this to be his responsibility. Just let Harry Potter do it. If magic was fading, let Harry Potter take care of it. But Draco knew that wasn't right. Chill the dungeons of Slytherin, gray the stone walls. Draco usually liked the atmosphere, but now it seemed too much like fading. The ancient first-year spells! What did you find? They're no more powerful than the spells we use now. My own experiment was a failure, Draco. There's something called the Interdict of Merlin, which stops anyone from getting knowledge of powerful spells out of books, even if you find and read a powerful wizard's notes, they won't make sense to you. It has to go from one living mind to another. I couldn't find any powerful spells that we had the instructions for, but couldn't cast. But if you can't get them out of old books, why would anyone bother passing them on by word of mouth after they stopped working? Did you get the data on the squib couples? Draco started to hand the parchment over. But Harry Potter held up a hand. Law of science, Draco. First, I tell you the theory and the prediction. Then you show me the data. That way, you know I'm not just making up a theory to fit. You know that the theory actually predicted the data in advance. The secret of blood is something called deoxyribose nucleic acid. You don't say that name in front of anyone who's not a scientist. Deoxyribose nucleic acid is the recipe that tells your body how to grow. Two legs, two arms, short or tall, whether you have brown eyes or green. It's a material thing. You can see it if you have microscopes. And that recipe has two copies of everything, always, in case one copy is broken. Imagine two long rows of pieces of paper. At each place in the row, there are two pieces of paper. And when you have children, your body selects one piece of paper at random from each place in the row. And the mother's body will do the same. And so the child gets two pieces of paper at each place in the row. Two copies of everything. One from your mother, one from your father, and when you have children, they get one piece of paper from you at random in each place. Now, when it comes to something like being short or tall, there are a lot of places in the recipe that make little differences. So if a tall father marries a short mother, the child gets some pieces of paper saying tall and some pieces of paper saying short. And usually the child ends up middle-sized. But not always. By luck, the child might get a lot of pieces saying tall and not many pieces saying short and grow up pretty tall. You could have a tall father with five papers saying tall, and a tall mother with five papers saying tall, and by amazing luck, the child gets all ten papers saying tall, and ends up taller than both of them. You see? Blood isn't a perfect fluid. It doesn't mix perfectly. Deoxyribus nucleic acid is made up of lots of little pieces, like a glass of pebbles instead of a glass of water. That's why a child isn't always exactly in the middle of the parents. Now, suppose that, just like with tallness, there's lots of little pieces in the recipe where you can have a piece of paper that says magic or not magic. If you have enough pieces of paper saying magic, you're a wizard. 
If you have a lot of pieces of paper, you're a powerful wizard. If you have too few, you're a muggle. And in between, you're a squib. Then, when two squibs marry, most of the time the children should also be squibs. But once in a while, a child will get lucky and get most of the father's magical papers and most of the mother's magical papers and be strong enough to be a wizard. But probably not a very powerful one. If you started out with a lot of powerful wizards and they married only each other, they would stay powerful. But if they started marrying muggle-borns who were just barely magical, or squibs, you see? The blood wouldn't mix perfectly. It would be a glass of pebbles, not a glass of water, because that's just the way blood works. There would still be powerful wizards now and then, when they got a lot of magic papers by luck. But they wouldn't be as powerful as the most powerful wizards from earlier. But... That's only one hypothesis. Suppose that instead, there's only a single place in the recipe that makes you a wizard. Only one place where a piece of paper can say magic or not magic. And there are two copies of everything, always. So then, there are only three possibilities. Both copies can say magic. One copy can say magic, and one copy can say not magic. Or, both copies can say not magic. Wizards, squibs, and muggles. Muggleborns wouldn't really be born to muggles, they would be born to two squibs. Two parents, each with one magic copy, who'd grown up in the muggle world. Now imagine a witch marries a squib. Each child will get one paper saying magic from the mother, always. It doesn't matter which piece gets picked at random, both say magic. But like flipping a coin, half the time the child will get a paper saying magic from the father, and half the time the child will get the father's paper saying not magic. When a witch marries a squib, the result won't be a lot of weak wizarding children. Half the children will be wizards and witches just as powerful as their mother, and half the children will be squibs. Because there is just one place in the recipe that makes you a wizard, then magic isn't like a glass of pebbles that can mix. It's like a single magical pebble, a sorcerer's stone. In which case, either you have two stones or you don't. Either you're a wizard or not. Powerful wizards would get that way by studying harder and practicing more. And if wizards get inherently less powerful, not because of spells being lost, but because people can't cast them, then maybe they're eating the wrong foods or something. But if it's gotten steadily worse over 800 years, then that could mean magic itself is fading out of the world. And that brings me to the prediction. What happens when two squibs marry? One quarter of the children would come up magic and magic and be wizards. One quarter would come up not magic and not magic and be muggles. The other half would be squibs. It's a very old and very classic pattern. It was discovered by Gregor Mendel, who is not forgotten, and it was the first hint ever uncovered for how the recipe worked. Anyone who knows anything about blood science would recognize that pattern in an instant. It wouldn't be exact, any more than if you flip a coin twice 40 times, you'd always get exactly 10 pairs of two heads. But if it's 7 or 13 wizards out of 40 children, that'll be a strong indicator. That's the test I had you do. Now let's see your data. And before Draco could even think, Harry Potter had taken the parchment out of Draco's hand. Six wizards out of 28 children. Well, that's that then. And first years were casting the same spells at the same power level eight centuries ago too. Your test and my test both came out the same way. There was a long silence in the classroom. He'd never been so terrified. It's not definite yet. My experiment failed, remember? I need you to design another test, Draco. I... I... I can't do this, Harry. It's too much for me. Yes, you can. Because you have to. I thought about it myself, too, after I found out about the interdict of Merlin. Draco, is there any way of observing the strength of magic directly? Some way that doesn't have anything to do with wizard's blood or the spells we learn. Anything that affects magic affects wizards. But then we can't tell if it's the wizards or the magic. What does magic affect that isn't a wizard? Magical creatures, obviously. Harry Potter slowly smiled. Draco, that's brilliant! It's the sort of dumb question you'd only ask in the first place if you'd been raised by muggles. Then the sickness in Draco's stomach got even worse as he realized what it would mean if magical creatures were getting weaker. They would know for certain then that magic was fading, and there was a part of Draco that was already sure that was exactly what they would find. He didn't want to see this. He didn't want to know. It was a wide portrait, but the three people in it were looking rather crowded. 
There was a middle-aged man from the 12th century who spoke to a sad-looking young woman from the 14th century, and she spoke to a dignified, wizened old man from the 17th century, and him they could understand. They had asked about Dementors. They had asked about Phoenixes. They had asked about dragons and trolls and house elves. Harry had frowned, pointed out that creatures which needed the most magic could just be dying out entirely, and had asked for the most powerful magical creatures known. There wasn't anything unfamiliar on the list, except for a species of dark creature called Mind Flayers, which the translator noted had finally been exterminated by Harold Shea, and those didn't sound half as scary as Dementors. Harry, what does this mean? Then Harry thanked all the portraits for helping. Draco, pretty much on automatic, did so as well, and more graciously and they headed back to the classroom. Observation Wizardry isn't as powerful now as it was when Hogwarts was founded. Hypotheses 1. Magic itself is fading. 2. Wizards are interbreeding with muggles and squibs. 3. Knowledge to cast powerful spells is being lost. 4. Wizards are eating the wrong foods as children, or something else besides blood is making them grow up weaker. 5. Muggle technology is interfering with magic. Since 800 years ago? 6. Stronger wizards are having fewer children. Draco equals only child? Check if three powerful wizards, Quarrel, Dumbledore, Dark Lord, had any children. Tests A. Are there spells we know but can't cast? 1 or 2. Or are the lost spells no longer known? 3. Result Inconclusive due to interdict of Merlin. No known uncastable spell, but could simply not have been passed on. B. Did ancient first-year students cast the same sort of spells with the same power as now? Weak evidence for 1 over 2, but blood could still be losing powerful wizardry only. Result. Same level of first-year spells then as now. C. Additional test that distinguishes 1 and 2 using scientific knowledge of blood We'll explain later. Result. There's only one place in the recipe that makes you a wizard, and either you have two papers saying magic, or you don't. D. Are magical creatures losing their powers? Distinguishes one from two or three. Result. Magical creatures seem to be as strong as they ever were. A. Failed. B. Is weak evidence for one over two. C. Falsifies two. D. Falsifies one. 4 was unlikely, and B argues against 4 as well. 5 was unlikely, and D argues against it. 6 is falsified along with 2. That leaves 3. Interdict of Merlin or not, I didn't actually find any known spell that couldn't be cast. So, when you add it all up, it looks like knowledge is being lost. And the trap snapped shut. As soon as the panic went away, as soon as Draco understood that magic wasn't fading out, it took all of five seconds to realize. So it was all just a stupid trick then. It was a fair test, Draco. If it had come out a different way, I would have accepted it. I didn't know anything you didn't know. I admit that I suspected. Hermione Granger was too powerful. She should have been barely magical and she wasn't. How can a Muggleborn be the best spellcaster in Hogwarts? And she's getting the best grades on her essays, too. It's too much coincidence for one girl to be the strongest magically and academically, unless there's a single cause. Hermione Granger's existence pointed to there being only one thing that makes you a wizard. Something you either have or you don't. And the power differences come from how much we know and how much we practice. And there weren't different classes for purebloods and muggleborns, and so on. There were too many ways the world didn't look the way it would look if you were right. But Draco, I didn't see anything you couldn't see too. I didn't perform any tests I didn't tell you about. I didn't cheat, Draco. I wanted us to work out the answer together. And I never thought that magic might be fading out of the world until you said it. It was a scary idea for me too. Whatever. You claim you're not going to run off and tell anyone else about this. Not without consulting you first. Fine. Then you and I are through. I'm going to just walk away and forget any of this ever happened. Draco, you can't forget. Don't you understand? That was your sacrifice. What are you talking about? But there was already a freezing coldness in Draco's spine. He knew even before Harry Potter said it. To become a scientist. 
You questioned one of your beliefs, not just a small belief, but something that had great significance to you. You did experiments, gathered data, and the outcome proved the belief was wrong. You saw the results and understood what they meant. Remember, Draco, you can't sacrifice a true belief that way because the conspirements will confirm it instead of falsifying it. Your sacrifice to become a scientist was your false belief that wizard blood was mixing and getting weaker. That's not true. I still believe that. Draco, I'm sorry, Draco. You don't believe it. Not anymore. Most people never realize there's a difference between believing something and thinking it's good to believe it. It's called belief in belief. And Draco, you don't believe any more in blood purism. I'll show you that you don't. If blood purism is true, then Hermione Granger doesn't make sense. So what could explain her? Maybe she's a wizarding orphan raised by muggles, just like I was. I could go to Granger and ask to see pictures of her parents, to see if she looks like them. Would you expect her to look different? Should we go perform that test? They would have put her with relatives. They'll still look the same. You see? You already know what experimental result you'll have to excuse. If you still believed in blood purism, you would say, Sure, let's go take a look. I bet she won't look like her parents. She's too powerful to be a real muggle-born. Scientists can do tests to check for sure if someone is the true child of a father. Granger would probably do it if I paid her family enough. She wouldn't be afraid of the results. So what do you expect that test to show? Tell me to run it and we will. But you already know what the test will say. You'll always know. You won't ever be able to forget. You might wish you believed in blood purism, but you'll always expect to see happen just exactly what would happen if there was only one thing that made you a wizard. That was your sacrifice to become a scientist. Do you realize what you've done? Draco surged forward. Do you realize what you've done? You had a belief. The belief was false. I helped you see that. What's true is already so. Owning up to it doesn't make it worse. The fingers on Draco's right hand clenched into a fist, and that hand dropped down and blasted up unstoppably and punched Harry Potter in the jaw so hard that his body went crashing into the floor. Idiot! 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 Draco, I'm sorry. I didn't think this would happen for months. I didn't expect you to awaken as a scientist this quickly. I thought I would have longer to prepare you, teach you the techniques that make it hurt less to admit you're wrong. What about father? Were you going to prepare him, or did you just not care what happened after this? You can't tell him! He's not a scientist! You promised, Draco! So you plan for me to lie to him and tell him I still believe. I'll always have to lie to him, and now when I grow up, I can't be a Death Eater, and I won't even be able to tell him why not. Your stepfather is a scientist. If you weren't going to be a scientist, he would still love you, but you'd be a little less special to him. You should have warned me. You should have warned me! I... I did. Every time I told you about the power, I told you about the price. I said you have to admit you're wrong. I said this would be the hardest path for you, that this was the sacrifice anyone had to make to become a scientist. I said, what if the experiment says one thing and your family and friends say another? You call that a warning? When we're doing a ritual that calls for a permanent sacrifice? I... I... I guess maybe I wasn't clear. I'm sorry, but that which can be destroyed by the truth should be. Hitting him wasn't enough. You're wrong about one thing. Granger isn't the strongest student in Hogwarts. She just gets the best grades in class. You're about to find out the difference. Expelliarmus! Harry's wand flew across the room. Gom jabber! A pulse of inky blackness struck Harry's left hand. That's a torture spell. It's for getting information out of people. I'm just going to leave it on you and lock the door behind me when I go. Maybe I'll set the locking spell to wear off after a few hours. Maybe it won't wear off until you die in here. Have fun. Malfoys are above the underage magic laws, I take it. It's not because your blood is stronger. It's because you already practiced. In the beginning, you were as weak as any of us. Is my prediction wrong? Just so you know, if you told me I was wrong, I would have listened. I won't ever torture you when you show me that I'm wrong. And you will. 
Someday, you're awakening as a scientist now, and even if you never learn to use your power, you'll always <gasps> be looking for ways to test your beliefs. He cast the most powerful locking charm he knew. Draco waited until he heard Harry's first scream before casting the Quietus. And then he walked away. <coughs> Harry's hand was really starting to hurt now, and that was interfering with his attempts to think creatively. But a few seconds later, Harry realized what he had to do. His pouch, unfortunately, was on the wrong side of his body, and it took some twisting to reach into it. Especially with his other arm flailing around in a reflex, unstoppable attempt to fling off the source of pain. Medical oh, kit! Medical kit! The package wasn't designed to be opened one-handed, because all wizards were idiots, that was why. Harry had to use his teeth, and so it took a while before Harry finally managed to wrap the numb cloth over his left hand. The Slytherin dorm was mostly empty. People were at dinner. For some reason, Draco himself wasn't feeling very hungry. Draco closed the door to his private room and started to cry. It wasn't fair. It wasn't fair. It was the first time Draco had ever really lost before. Father had warned him that losing for real would hurt the first time it happened. But he'd lost so much. It wasn't fair. It wasn't fair for him to lose everything the very first time he lost. Somewhere in the dungeons, a boy Draco had actually liked was screaming in pain. Draco had never hurt anyone he'd liked before. Punishing people who deserved it was supposed to be fun, but this just felt sick inside. Father hadn't warned him about that, and Draco wondered if this was a hard lesson everyone had to learn when they grew up, or if Draco was just weak. Draco wished it were pansy screaming. That would have felt better. And the worst part was knowing that it might have been a mistake to hurt Harry Potter. Draco would have to go back to Harry Potter because there was nowhere else for him to go. And if Harry Potter said he didn't want him, then Draco would be nothing. Just a pathetic little boy who could never be a Death Eater, never join Dumbledore's faction, never learn science. The trap had been perfectly set. Perfectly executed. Father had warned Draco over and over that what you sacrificed to dark rituals couldn't be regained. But Father hadn't known that the accursed muggles had invented rituals that didn't need wands. Rituals you could be tricked into doing without knowing it. And that was only one of the terrible secrets which scientists knew and which Harry Potter had brought with him. He didn't want this. He didn't want this! But there was no turning back. It was too late. He was already a scientist. Draco knew he should go back and free Harry Potter and apologize. It would have been the smart thing to do. He'd already hurt Harry Potter. It might be the only time Draco ever got to hurt him, and he would have to hold to that one memory for the rest of his life. Let him keep screaming. Well, Harry's mind said silently into itself when it had recovered enough to think words again. Was it worth it? Slowly, Harry's functional hand reached up to a desk. Harry pulled himself to his feet took a deep breath, exhaled, smiled. It wasn't much of a smile, but it was a smile nonetheless. Thank you, Professor Quirrell. I couldn't have lost without you. It hadn't redeemed Draco yet, not even close. Contrary to what Draco himself might now believe, Draco was still the child of a Death Eater, through and through. Still a boy who'd grown up thinking rape was something the cool older kids did. But it was one heck of a start. Harry couldn't claim it had all gone just as planned. It had all gone just as completely made up on the spot. The plan hadn't called for this to happen until December or thereabouts, after Harry had taught Draco the techniques to not deny the evidence when he saw it. But he'd seen the look of fear on Draco's face, realized that Draco was already taking an alternative hypothesis seriously, and seized the moment. One case of true curiosity had the same sort of redeeming power and rationality that one case of true love had in movies. In retrospect, Harry had given himself hours to make the most important discovery in the history of magic, and months to break through the undeveloped mental barriers of an 11-year-old boy. This could indicate that Harry had some sort of major cognitive deficit with respect to estimating task completion times. Harry turned and staggered toward the door. Time to test Draco's locking spell. The first step was simply trying to turn the doorknob. Draco could have been bluffing. 
Draco hadn't been bluffing. Finite incantatum! Harry's voice came out rather hoarse, and he could feel that the spell hadn't taken. Time to bring out the big guns. This spell was one of the most powerful he'd learned so far. Aloha mora! And the classroom door still didn't open. That shocked Harry. Harry hadn't been planning on going anywhere near Dumbledore's Forbidden Corridor, of course. But a spell to open magical locks had seemed like a useful sort of spell anyway, and so Harry had learned it. Was Dumbledore's Forbidden Corridor meant to lure people so stupid that they didn't notice the security was worse than what Draco Malfoy could put on it? Harry didn't know any explosive or cutting or smashing spells, and transfiguring explosives would have violated the rule against transfiguring things to be burned. Fear was creeping back into Harry's system. The placard in the medical kit had said the numcloth could only safely be used for up to 30 minutes. After that, it would come off automatically and not be reusable for 24 hours. Right now, it was 6.51 p.m. He'd put on the numcloth about five minutes ago. Harry's time turner wouldn't open until 9 p.m. After that, he could go back to 6 p.m. before the door was locked. How long would the torture spell last? Harry swallowed hard. Tears were coming into his eyes again. His brilliant creative mind had just offered the ingenious suggestion that Harry could cut his hand off using the hacksaw and the tool set stored in his pouch, which would hurt, obviously, but might hurt a lot less than Draco's pain spell since the nerves would be gone, and he had tourniquets in the healer's kit. And that was obviously a hideously stupid idea that Harry would regret the rest of his entire life. But Harry didn't know if he could hold out for two hours under torture. He wanted out of this classroom, he wanted out of this classroom now. He didn't want to wait in here screaming for two hours until he could use the time turner. He needed to get out and to find someone to get the torture spell off his hand. Think, Harry screamed at his brain. Think, think, think. If only when his time turner opened, he could go back and prevent. And that was when Harry realized he was being silly. This wasn't the first time he'd been locked in a room. Professor McGonagall had already told him the correct way to do this. She'd also told him not to use the time-turner for this sort of thing. Would Professor McGonagall realize that this occasion really did warrant a special exception? Or just take away the time-turner entirely? And then, Harry waited. Seconds passed, feeling like years. At 7.07pm, the door opened. Are you alright, Harry? I got a note saying you'd been locked in here.